Thank you very much for coming to my presentation. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Lean Startup, so it will be more uh, business-oriented presentation. Um, we just want to find out a bit about yourself first. Uh, just want to ask you a few questions. Um, how many of you do own a startup or work for a startup company? Anybody here? Okay, and how many developers do we have here? People who can code? Okay, and uh, any project managers or business analysts? Yeah, okay, so we've got a mixture here. Okay. Uh, so, guys, I want to start a business. I've got an idea. I think I uh, managed to find a problem that I can solve. And I would like to run you, run very quickly through a scenario and then I want to ask you whether you think that this business idea of mine is good or not. Whether you think that I will be able to succeed or not. Um, so before I... Um, before I tell you about my solution, I will, I will, I will present uh, the problem itself. So it's a, it's a scenario. So imagine yourself sitting at home after coming back from work. You are a bit tired. Uh, you are getting a bit hungry. Your girlfriend or your boyfriend or wife, husband, partner are coming from work soon as well. He or she is also a young professional and you know that you will have to eat something. You will have to have dinner together. So what are the options for you? The first one is to just go out and have something to eat in a restaurant. But you, you don't really fancy dressing up and going out. Uh, the second option is to just cook something quickly, but you don't have anything in the fridge and the trip to a supermarket is not very appealing. You don't want to go to a local shop either. Um, you can also order something from the takeaway, but you do not really fancy anything unhealthy. Um, so what are your options? So I think that I managed to recognize that there is an opportunity here, a business opportunity here. And I've got a solution to this. So imagine that you've got a website. You go to the website and you can quickly choose what you would like to eat today. Whether you want to have a beef, chicken, pork, fish, or maybe a vegetarian dish tonight, you just pick one. Say you want a pork dish, this is what you fancy today. Then. then you choose time. You decide how long you are uh, prepared to spend to actually make your dish yourself. So say half an hour, something like that. Then the website is going to give you a list of dishes that you can actually do yourself at home, prepare. You pick one that you fancy. Then the website takes you to another page which will suggest you a, a good bottle of wine that would go with, with your dish. You pick one and you go to the checkout. You pay for it. And my company will deliver all the ingredients to you. And all you will have to do is to just spend time in the kitchen with your partner and cook yourself a nice dish. There are many um, other benefits of this idea. First of all, you will probably eat more healthy um, because you will stop ordering food from, from other unhealthy takeaways. You will also minimize the waste 
of, uh, of food because you will get only those ingredients that you actually need for that particular dish. So my question is, will my business work? Do you think that this is a viable idea? Do you think this is, it is, it is worth, worth pursuing this? I know that there are maybe many problems like how uh, we are going to actually uh, fail these disorders, but there are technicalities. In general, the business model, um, in general, the business model, do you think this is, this is going to work? Let's have a vote, a quick vote. Who thinks that this is a good business idea? Come on. <laughs> okay. And who thinks that it is not a good idea? The rest, I presume. And who is not very sure? Okay, so you thought that that was actually a good idea. Yeah? Excellent. Why do you think it is going to work? I'm positive. I'm optimistic. Yeah? yeah uh, <laughs> only optimistic or? At yeah, the moment, yes. At the moment, yes. Okay. Uh, you thought it wouldn't work? Uh, I wasn't that sure. Uh, yeah. Okay, you wasn't sure. You thought it wouldn't work. Why not? Yeah, I think it's expensive to deliver these things. And you, you mentioned it's technicalities, but I think uh, you should probably think about a way to minimize uh, your participation in this business. I mean, just provide a website that provides a platform, not the exact services, delivery of services, because you should delegate this to I didn't tell you what this business model actually works in one of the Scandinavian countries, I think it's like Sweden, I'm not sure uh, which one, but I was thinking about running that in, in a city like for example in London or in Italy. So, uh, okay, that's a very good insight. Anything else? Does anybody else want to comment on this? Carry on? No? Okay. That's fine. So this is this is in general the, the business model. I didn't tell you one thing. This is actually not the new thing somebody did it before the number. So there was a company called Dinner.com. They started in 2012. Um, at the very beginning, in 2012, they ran a crowdfunding um, campaign. They managed to secure, just based on the, the idea, they managed to secure 60,000 uh, pounds of investment. And they actually developed the system. They started running the system in London. Uh, later on, in 2014, they ran another crowdfunding campaign, they needed more money, and they were, again they were successful, there were a lot of investors that were interested in this company, however, they decided not to take the investment, and they decided to close the company. That was a decision that the CEO, CEO of the company took. Uh, he could have taken the money, could have uh, carry on with his business, but he decided not to because he realized that he is not able to bring in enough business uh, for the company to, to actually to last. He wouldn't be able to make money. And what is very interesting about this business and his conclusion is the, the reason why he thinks uh, his company failed. Obviously, there, there's, there's not only one reason, but there is one key reason. And this is the reason. They were not solving anyone's problems. So basically, people did not want the service. And there may be many reasons. Uh, the, the owner of the company wrote a very nice blog post about lessons that he learned from his business. Uh, but basically, he admitted that there was, there was, uh, there weren't any market for any service. If the city is big enough, then maybe it will, maybe in Italy, okay, of course. Sorry, I cannot hear. I mean, in Italy, probably, it's too small a city for them, but if the city is big enough, then maybe it will be some of the problem, of course. 
Mm. Well, did it work in London, basically? Did it work in, with, uh, in London? This is the important thing here. We are not serving anyone's problem. Nobody wanted that. Maybe not nobody, but not enough people for the business to, to actually to, to be viable. So, there was a survey from Baxter's, a very careful survey from Baxter's at Fortune.com on uh, startups and why they actually fail. I don't think this is new to you. I think that many people know that the majority of the startups, the new companies, fail actually. So only one out of ten companies is successful. But what is really interesting from this survey is this thing. This is the biggest reason why startup, startups fail. 42% of companies fail because they actually build products or services that nobody wants. So they spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort building something that later on nobody wants. So the question is like, why do they actually, uh, why are they not able to find out whether what they are building is something that is going to work? People just start building something and ship it to the customer and they find out that that's not, it was just a total waste of time and money. 42%, that's important things. I think to notice. So this question is wrong. If you want to start a company, you shouldn't be asking yourself this question because practically everything that you do is built these days. You should be asking yourself this question, should this product be built? And this is a very difficult question to answer because you as a, an entrepreneur, you don't know that. Your potential customers, they know that. So you need to, you need to find the answers from them. But This is, a wrong, this is the wrong thing to do. This is what I did at the very beginning. I asked you questions whether uh, I pitched the business to you and I asked you whether it's going to work or not. You, some of you said yes, it would work. Some of them said no, it wouldn't. But um, the, the thing is that if you do that, if you ask your customers, you will face a few problems here. First of all, people are very optimistic about the future behavior. So we all know about uh, New Year's resolutions, for example. We make so many re uh, resolutions and then we don't stick to them. We say, oh, we will start going to the gym in January 2016. How long does it last? Maybe for a month or two? For many people? Um, we we'll stop smoking, stop uh, doing things that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, but we don't stick to those promises. So we are very optimistic, but we, we say we uh, want more dependent on healthy food from takeaways. We will learn how to cook it later on this on the takeaway and on the fish and chips, for example. So that's, that's one reason. The second reason you shouldn't ask your customers directly is that people often do not know what they want. And this is true. This is true because we, we don't know what is possible. Um, a very good example of this is, is this, mobile phone. Everybody's got it now. But back in 1992, I think, when there was a debate about uh, the viability of mobile telecommunications, um, the chairman of Intel Corporation, Andrew, Andrew Grove, uh, said that the idea that everybody will have a personal communicator in their po pocket is just a pipe dream driven by greed. So basically something that uh, it's, it's like, like a, a dream that will never, never ever happen. And now everybody's got it. 
everybody uses. So uh, this is what Steve Jobs also said, that people very often do not know whether they will be using something or not until actually you show them that particular thing. And unfortunately, many entrepreneurs today, uh, they, they take this, this words to, to heart and they try to build something with, with this irrational hope that people will actually start using this service or this product. Uh, but unfortunately, as you know, most of the ideas do not work. And the last reason why you shouldn't pitch on your idea to potential custom customers is that people want to, want to make you happy, especially people who you know, especially your family and friends. They will want you to succeed, they will like you, they will tell them, yes, yes, this is a very good idea, especially if they find out that you've made quite a lot of effort already to, to, to do something. They will want you to succeed and they will encourage you to carry on. Whereas you probably should. Very often. The, the last reason is very nicely uh, described in this, in this book, The Mountains. This book is about how to talk to customers and learn if your business is a good idea when everybody is lying to you. So that's a very good book. I would really recommend it. Um, don't forget the mount test. Um, the, the, the most important idea from this book is that you should ask people about their past behaviors, not about future behaviors. So you basically, you don't ask them if you will be interested in ordering uh, ingredients from my company so that you can, you can cook dinner. You ask them different questions. You ask them, um, how often do you order food from takeaways? Uh, do you cook at home? Um, how often do you cook? Then you can learn actually whether your business model will fit into their behavior. And if you think that it will, then you can present, you can give, some, give something away, you can tell those people that, yes, uh, I can see how my business idea would actually work for you. And if they are still enthusiastic about this solution, you can ask them for commitment. If they commit, you will know that they are truly enthusiastic. If they don't, you are not so sure then. How do you ask them for commitment? Probably you, you, you can ask them for some investment, small investment. You can say, give me 20 years as an investor into my company, in a few weeks I will deliver this product and you will be able to order your first dish of wine and I will give you a bottle of wine for free, for example. If they commit to that, it means like, yes, you are arriving at something that, that, that may be viable. Okay, so now I'm going to the Lean Startup. So does anybody know this book? Yeah, this is quite a, quite a big book, 350 pages. Very good read, very interesting. But there is a version for busy people also. I don't know how many pages the people are members here. <laughs> But this is basically a, a brief a summary of this, of this big book. So Lean is a framework. Uh, Lean is a framework that actually allows you to, uh, to, to ensure, you can use it to ensure that uh, what you are building is what your customers will want and will use. Uh, it was Eric, Eric Rice who first realized that there was a massive problem with uh, startups. So too many people are building too many things that people then don't use. And he came up with this new startup methodology. It's not a new thing. It was something that uh, was taken from the uh, manufacturing industry, from Toyota. They had the lean. Um, 
process implemented in the factory. So basically what he did, he adapted that process to uh, web development, to, to digital projects. So he realized, he realized that in a, a traditional com the traditional corporate structure will not work for startups. In, in a typical corporation, big company, you develop a plan and then you stick to the plan. You decide on your budget, you decide on your deadline, then you stick to the plan, you spend a lot of time, a lot of money to build something and then you release it to the customers. This is what very often happens. This doesn't work for startups. This doesn't work for startups because if you actually end up building something that nobody wants, then the, your deadline and your budget become completely irrelevant. Imagine the lean startup, that the lean startup methodology is like driving a car. So basically, you know your destination, you know what you want to achieve, but you still have to steer your car to get to that destination. So in business speak, you still have got your vision, you still got your strategy, and you've got your startup, your, your, your entity that you steer, that you basically drive to achieve your, your, your vision. And you learn as you go. So like with driving a car, you know where you are getting to, but you may have to stop, you may have to uh, wait for a bit, you may have to turn and take a detour, for example, if there are any obstacles. Or you may even have to change your destination when the one that you are getting to is not appealing anymore. Validated learning is one of the most important concepts of the Lean Startup methodology. So basically, validated learning is all about, all about learning from your customers whether you are doing the right thing or not. So, this is what you focus on. You always focus on what your customers want. This is, this is, this is focus. However, you ignore what they say about it. Lean Startup is a methodology that, that will allow you to find out what the customer wants you are asking. We are having to ask them. And you don't want to ask them for the reasons I uh, listed before. So basically, in a Lean Startup, every action is an experiment. So you do something in order to learn something from it. And then based on the outcome, you take your next step and you learn again. But your experiments would be useless unless you can interact with your customers. Because you need your customers to be able to, 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 to learn what works and what doesn't work. So in a Lean Startup, there is a concept of a minimum viable product. And the minimum viable product is that product, and I put the product into quotation uh, for a reason I'll tell you about in a moment. But minimum viable product is this kind of, maybe like a small, web application or something like that that will allow you to interact with the customers and collect data. Learn whether they are interested or not in your product. I, said, I, I put the product in uh, quotes because this is not really a product. They call it minimum viable product in the inside of methodology, but it doesn't have to be a product. It can be just a, a landing page with a sign up and uh, AdWords campaign initial. So this is something that um, they did in Estonia with the EU residency at the very beginning. I learned from the presentation before. They created a page and then invited people to register initially. We don't have anything behind, we don't have any registration behind. 
by then, but by doing that simple exercise, they learned that in one day, they got interest from 4,000 people. It doesn't matter that some of the people did it just for fun, but some of the customers were genuine. What really matters is that they learned something from it. They collected some data. They were able to contact those customers if they wanted to, to get more information. They could make changes to the minimum viable product and run the campaign again and then see how, how it works. They probably learned about the potential customers, where, where they come from. And as you can see, they developed the, the whole business model behind this. They didn't even know at the beginning what they are getting. They just had some sort of rough idea. That was my impression of this presentation. And this is, this is the thing to do. You just learn. You just learn. So of course it requires uh, good human judgment to know what kind of minimum fiber product you need. Uh, you need to think about this, you need to think what would allow you, what you can produce at the minimum effort that would allow you to collect as much information about your customers as possible. So this is how it works. You start with an idea. Uh, you think about what you need to do to learn. What can you do very quickly to learn more about the idea, or if the idea is viable or not. And you, you build something. You sit down and you build something, and you end up with some code, some sort of landing page, something that allows you to interact with your potential customers. And you want that, because then you can measure and collect data. And when you've got the data, you learn from the data. And then you come up with more ideas. You see what works and what doesn't work. And you go again, and again, and again through that iteration. Eventually, at some point, you will realize whether you've got a viable business or whether you don't have a valuable business. This allows you to stop at any point without committing, with committing as little time and as little money as possible. So yeah, so the key here is to iterate through this cycle as quickly and as often as possible. So, as I said, the minimum viable product can just be like a mock-up page. It doesn't really have to be anything that, that, that really works. If you can find a different way of showing your customers some, something, I don't know, maybe even you know, a printout, I could show you something here. And as long as, as um, I could collect some information that I want from you, that would be good. That would be a very good first minimum viable product. I could probably then uh, give you uh, collect uh, your email addresses and send you an email once I put something online, then you would come back to my, my landing page and I would measure how you interact with it. I would uh, learn whether you are still interested in it or not. But the key is you constantly ask yourself a question. Whether you are making any progress to believe that the business idea is valid. This is why you are doing this information. So you do your first iteration as you think like, well, it doesn't work quite well, but I've got some response. So maybe if I tweak it here and there, maybe if I change something, it will become more appealing to my customers. You make the change, you run the campaign again, and you'll have to constantly learn from it. So now, because this is a Drupal camp, I think I should say something about Drupal as well. So uh, I believe that Drupal is very suitable for uh, building of MVPs. And there are many reasons behind. So the first reason is, and this is just for you as an audience, because you everybody knows Drupal here, right? Yeah? Okay. 
And this is the reason, because you are familiar with it. And because you are familiar with it, uh, you will be able to build something much quicker. Just remember, you just want something minimal, something that you can build quickly and, and show to people. We don't care about technology. This is a secondary issue. MVP will probably be scrapped later on when you, when you, when you need to build a real system, then you will start thinking about technology. But yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons. You can build 80% of more of your MVP without any code. Again, that allows you to go out and ask for feedback very, very quickly. You don't have to code, you, just, you can just download some modules with key app, with decorate content type, uh, without, without any, without absolutely any code. That's a good thing. Developing is expensive. And another reason is uh, the active and very helpful Drupal community. You, you run into any problems, you can ask people. And there's always someone who will be able to help you. So, are you familiar, familiar with uh, Drupal distributions? Who is familiar with Drupal distributions? Yeah. So, uh, for those who are not, Drupal distribution is just a uh, uh, Drupal core and some modules bundled together to serve a certain purpose. So, for example, if you run a publishing company, you may uh, find a Drupal distribution uh, that is actually put together for publishers. And there is a Drupal distribution for doing MVPs. It's, it's, it's on the Drupal.org website, you can just download it, set it up, and uh, it's going to give you certain features that you will most probably want. It's still, it's still in development, it is based on uh, Panopoly distribution. Panopoly distribution is a, a very highly regarded Drupal distribution, like a, like a startup, not a startup distribution, like a base distribution for creating other distributions. So it actually, actually bundles together all the most important modules for Drupal 7 that you would probably use later. So MVP Drupal distribution is based on uh, an Apple distribution, and that's a good thing. Uh, it gives you an up-to-date, uh, it gives you up-to-date and secure version of all popular modules that you would probably want to use in your MVP. It provides you with some default values that are safe uh, for site builders after install. And it works with Drupal apps. Are you familiar with Drupal apps? So, Drupal apps allow you to set things up very quickly. Uh, I thought I would tell you a bit more about those Drupal apps uh, and how they actually appear to the community. First of all, we have modules, some modules provided uh, some functionality that extended the Drupal core. There were problems with modules because uh, when you install a module, you still need to do a configuration. And then if you uh, have to uh, create similar functionality on another website uh, or in a different environment, you still have to click and do the configuration. So uh, the Drupal community came up with features uh, features basically were modules that uh, are modules that are able to uh, hold configurations of those modules as well. So site building became much quicker, uh, releases became much quicker because you could just take a feature from one Drupal website and put that into another. So if you had different environments, you could just develop the features. And then we've got also apps now. This is a new thing. Uh, there are like features but they are stored in a central location and all you need to do in your Drupal uh, installation is, is to install your connector modules and you will be provided with an interface that will allow you to install features in your Drupal uh, or website. So you basically decide what you want. Uh, if, you want if you need block for your MVP, for example, you can just press a button and it's uh, it will download all the modules with some, some configuration for you. So, uh, I really like cloud computing and I uh, 
uh, I, I did create quite a few MVPs like Korea and I really like uh, the way you can deploy things to cloud computing. First of all, from a business perspective, this is um, this is the main reason why I like it. You can pay for your infrastructure for services. You can pay for your for your servers like you're paying for electricity. You don't want it anymore, you just switch it off. Um, so there is no cap capital expenditure required up front. Um, so you can just switch on and off anytime you want. Or or you don't have to pay at all. Because many providers offer you so-called um, um, trial periods. And for example, AWS offers you uh, basic servers, database server, web server, for a period of one year without charging you at all. So you can just register that you can do a this on AWS, for example. I'm sure that Azure and other providers do something similar. Well, I, I do use AWS. And then how Agile methodologies fit in? Um, Lean itself is a methodology that requires you uh, to be Agile because you iterate very quickly through the cycle. Uh, so you need, um, you, need, you, you need to respond to changes. You need to respond to the data that, uh, that are coming from your, from your experiments. Uh, so uh, my recommendation is to to, to do whatever works for you. If you are just one person, or if you are working, if you work only with another developer, then something like Scrum will be very, uh, will, will bring in a lot of overheads and it's not worth doing. Um, I like uh, Kanban. I usually set up Kanban board uh, for the start of projects. And I do that because I've got all my work visualized. And this is the most important thing. I can go there and I can see everything. So this is how I do it, for example. This is Trello, a very nice tool, which is free. I don't know if you know it or not. But you can set up your list here, which actually uh, corresponds to the stages at which every task in your, in your project is. And then you create tickets like this and you move them across the stages so you can have a quite of version in progress awaiting feedback done. So I use Agile methodologies very in a very limited manner, but quite heavily. This this works for me. This even works for my uh, personal life when I put things that I have to do. Okay. Uh, so this is the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for that, uh, for listening to me. Uh, this is a bit about myself. Uh, I'm Polish. I've lived in London for about 12 years. Uh, for the last seven years, I uh, have been uh, freelancing, consulting for different businesses in London, small and big. Did some projects for CNN, at the moment I'm doing some work for the Bank of England, but I also work with uh, startups. I really like startups. And this is my startup, I'm a co owner, it's very early stage. Uh, uh, if you want, please connect with me on LinkedIn and you can also follow me on Twitter. Um, okay, so do you have any questions first? Because later on, I will to ask you some questions. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, I actually have a few questions, first of all, down this technical. Uh, you mentioned all apps and approach. And what can you say about a great deal of um, one of the modules inside the distribution in case the distribution is not up to date? I mean, in mm -hmm. case distribution doesn't have new update. I noticed that uh, for one of the distribution it's not possible to upgrade on each particular mm -hmm. thing. I just need to wait for uh, developers yeah. to, do those, to release yeah. this. Yeah, that's correct. And this is a problem when you build a web application. Then you've got this problem you have to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, 
And there are, there are, there are, there are you know, different ways of doing that. You can just work your distribution and you can start on your own. You can, you know, you can then do with your, uh, whatever you want with the Drupal uh, main file, technically speaking, right? But this is a problem that is not really a problem for MVPs. And why? Because the MVP that you're going to build will be scrapped in a week to all of them. So you will actually care. And another question is um, is about getting right people on board. Uh, yeah, I have been working with startup startups for a few years, and I noticed that um, a lot of senior developers they they don't realize why they can't do perfect solutions. You know, they want to make build something stable, but within MVP, it's probably not not a good uh, way to do things. I mean, it can be. In ideal, I mean, I, I um, not ideal. Mm -hmm. So, and um, if you uh, if you are working with, um, if you are hiring some people, what can you advise? I mean, um, uh, how to find people who are familiar with uh, uh, approaches you mentioned? Uh, because it's not so easy. Actually. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not so easy. You, you see, it's it's again, it's it's a human judgment. It's hard to you to determine what skills you need and then find the right piece of person with those skills, technical skills, and probably the soft skill that would, uh, would be working with you uh, effectively on what you have to do. Uh, with MVPs, I think that, uh, as I mentioned before, I reckon that uh, technology doesn't matter. So I would use something that is easy to uh, that is easy to use. So Drupal, for example, is known that it has quite a steep learning curve. But once you learn that, and if you have already learned that, there's a lot of flexibility, and that allows you to, to build MVPs very, very quickly. Yeah. So if you are not a developer, but if you've got a Drupal friend who, who knows Drupal, you could maybe a chain you know, to, to build your MVP, for example. Uh, just on a project basis. Okay. I mean, I mean, probably maybe uh, there there are some groups, some Drupal groups, Drupal that work that that I mean that discuss the MVPs and startups. Uh, there, I can hire some some somebody for my project. I mean, the, the people that should be hired, uh, they are not um, on an MVP. They have some different mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this is the difficulty. Yeah, yeah. And do you know such? Such groups or um, social communities uh, of Drupal is well familiar with uh, me. Uh, I don't. I don't think it is. I very often developers want to focus on you know, development. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to work with you need to work with the communications basically. This is this is a methodology that you can uh, apply and you know that you can work with anybody because okay, for example you hire a developer. You, they, they don't even need to know about the thing. You just, what is it called, etc. You just communicate with them. This is what I want. I want to do it very quickly. I don't care about the quality of the code. I just need it to work because I want to learn the how Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me in a day? Can you do that for me in two hours? Then he will come back to me and say, like, yeah, no, it's going to be, you know, it's crappy. It's, you know, it's, it's all right. I don't care. This is what I want to you know. Later, we'll make something. Different something ideal, but for now, I think yeah, this is this is just a very good thing to go. So it's all about communication. It's all about communication. Communication is very important from any of the projects. And many projects fail because of communication. Any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, I have a question of uh, you mentioned uh, of driving the project forward. Uh, ignoring what users actually say they want and actually measuring the new ideas from the data and trying to try to better. Where does uh, direct like new ideas from real users get into that project? For example, if you if you actually see real users saying that the thing would be better if it, it could do that or if it did this that way, uh, you can't really ignore that. Well, no, you, you still you still listen to that because then you are already engaged. So at that point they register maybe on your MVP or send you an email after seeing your website, you can see an interest. You didn't have to go to them and pitch your MVP, right? They already came to you. 
that you, you what you've learned is that okay, they are actually they, they see a potential in it and they make suggestions and this is your data, this is what you want, this feedback that you want you want to learn from learn from. It's it's not uh, so yeah, there will be many things coming that you won't have to ignore because there are some for some sort of uh, features that uh, do not even really fit into your business model or maybe you will find out that okay this is something that you should consider putting away on the back burner. This is all this is all that you collect on that. So there are a lot of differences in the engagement of the people or yeah 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 if you always want to do something quick and clever that will allow you to collect as much people as possible. Okay any questions? Yeah. Um okay just as a short notice for anybody interested uh, in relating to uh, the lead startup, there's a tool like a conceptual, sort of conceptualization tool called the Javelin board. You can Google for Javelin board, which is like the thing that you can throw, same word. Um, so there, it's like a big sheet that you can print, like A0 a size or whatever. And the idea is that you write business ideas and then you write like what assumptions making when you're coming up with that idea and then the idea is to uh, or the goal is to go to actual potential customers or people that you think would be a customer and not to go to your mother or people that know you but go to somebody who doesn't know you and, and then try to validate whether or not the, whatever idea you came up with is viable and if it's not you talk to them and then you see maybe you come up with some other little tweak idea that looks like a tweak and it's a way of uh, trying to validate a business idea within like a weekend instead of like six months and spending thousands and thousands of euros on it and building something that everybody wants. So. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. No, one short comment. I heard about this in news lately also that instead of trying to build something with proof of it, and maybe fake it by having people doing it behind the scenes. Uh, maybe as a programmer, you wouldn't. If, if the volumes are not that uh, large, you can maybe have somebody actually doing something exactly. at the office exactly. and then pretend it's not an awesome system. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 For example, if those recipes in the first example you have, or mm -hmm. wines or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there could be lots of discussion, discussion on that. Uh, we need to finish shortly, but before we go, uh, can I ask you, so who's got a startup here? Or who is trying to build something? You, you, and you as well, and you, and you, okay. I know that this country is very, uh, quite famous uh, when it comes to this startup business, uh, digital stuff, etc. I use Skype, for example, it was developed here, transfer wise as well. So, so I thought I would bring some gold with me to invest in your startups. There you go. I expect shares for that. <laughs> Who else? Who else would want to keep that? Okay. You can throw it. Okay, you can throw it. And this is a big one. Who wants this? You've got to start up, right? That's from the Bank of England. Thanks. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>